Let's jump into the one of the most amazing books in the Bible, a book that all on its own proves the supernatural origin of the Bible, the book of Daniel. We'll tackle the elephant in the room first. When was it written? The book of Daniel contains several prophecies that were fulfilled with stunning accuracy and precision centuries after they were written down. For those who believe the Bible is the inspired Word of God, it's obvious that Daniel was given a supernatural insight into the future. Some scholars, however, argue that these prophecies were actually written after the events had already taken place. Their primary argument is that it's too accurate to have been written beforehand. Now, how's that for circular reasoning? It can't be prophecy because it came true. Others claim literary differences show that parts of it were written at different times, as if Daniel's own writing style would not have evolved as he aged from around 18 years old to 80 plus while he was in Babylon. If parts of this book were written after the fact, it would mean that the book of Daniel, a critical book of the Bible, a book Jesus himself quoted from, is deliberately misleading and deceptive, an elaborate work of sacred forgery. This would invalidate the entire premise of Scripture. I trust Scripture, and there's no doubt in my mind that the book of Daniel was written in its entirety in the 6th century B.C. Now let's get into a few of the most amazing prophecies ever. We'll go through them in the chronological order in which Daniel experienced them, beginning with one of the most famous prophecies in history, the statue in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In chapter 2, Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, is troubled by a mysterious dream. He calls in all his wise men, his sorcerers and soothsayers, and demands that they tell him what the dream was and what it meant. Since he won't tell them what the dream was, and since they can't possibly read his mind to know what the dream was, they're unable to make up an interpretation to please him. He orders them all killed. And that killing is underway when word of this situation reaches Daniel. A young man in his mid to late teens from high Jewish society who was brought to Babylon as part of the Babylonian captivity. Daniel is a devout follower of God, and God reveals both the content and interpretation of Nebuchadnezzar's dream to him. Daniel makes haste to the king and tells him that the dream featured a giant statue made of various metals a head of gold, chest and arms of silver, belly and thighs of bronze, legs of iron, and feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Then a great stone, not cut by human hands, slammed into the iron and clay feet and shattered them, before crushing the entire statue into chaff and growing into a mountain that filled the earth. Daniel explains that the statue represents a sequence of empires that would dominate the world stage. The head of gold symbolizes Babylon itself under Nebuchadnezzar's rule. Daniel didn't name the coming empires, but with the benefit of hindsight, we can easily see the ones that the prophecy perfectly predicted. Following Babylon, three more empires would rise. The Medo-Persian Empire, the silver chest and arms, the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great, the bronze belly and thighs, and finally, the iron legs symbolize a stronger, more enduring empire. Traditionally, this fourth kingdom has been seen as the Roman Empire, known for its strength, vast territory, and the iron grip of its rule. But a newer theory posits that the Islamic Empire, from the Caliphates to the Ottoman Empire, is the fulfillment of the fourth empire in Nebuchadnezzar's dream, not Rome. Proponents of this view argue that the Islamic empire's significant impact on history, its control over a much larger region than the Roman empire, and its longevity make it a more fitting candidate. The stone that destroyed the statue is the coming reign of Jesus, which will destroy all earthly kingdoms once and for all and which will last forever. The accuracy with which these empires rose and fell, 
aligning with the materials of the statue is nothing short of remarkable. In addition to the empires developing top-down, beginning with the head, each empire demonstrated characteristics corresponding to the metals in the statue. Babylon's wealth and opulence are well documented, fitting the description of the golden head. The Medo-Persians, who overtook Babylon, are aptly represented by silver. Silver is less valuable than gold, but their empire was broader and stronger. The bronze of the Greek empire reflects the enduring legacy of Alexander's conquest, spreading Hellenistic culture far and wide. Finally, the iron strength of the Fourth Empire, whether Roman or Islamic, showcases military might and lasting impact on the world. Daniel's prophecy of the statue was fulfilled with amazing accuracy that stretched far into his future, with its conclusion yet to come in our own future. And we'll see in the next prophecy that God wasn't done speaking through Daniel about these empires. These empires are critically important, as evidenced by the continuing expansion and illumination on them as Daniel's visions continued over the years. In this nocturnal vision, which came to Daniel 50 years after Nebuchadnezzar's statue dream, Daniel sees a great sea churned by the four winds of heaven, from which emerge four distinct beasts. Each beast symbolizes a mighty empire, marked by unique characteristics and destined for an eventual downfall, only to be replaced by God's everlasting kingdom. The precise fulfillment of this prophecy is mind-blowing. The first beast, resembling a lion with eagle's wings, embodies the splendor and swiftness of the Babylonian Empire. As Daniel watches, the beast is stripped of its wings, a metaphor for King Nebuchadnezzar's humbling experience of going mad and living outside like an animal. The beast then stands erect like a man, signifying his restoration and subsequent acknowledgement of God's authority. Here's where the precision of this prophecy gets wild. The second beast is a bear leaning to one side with three ribs clenched between its teeth. With the benefit of hindsight, we know that the bear represents the Medo-Persian Empire. Its lopsided posture indicates the Persians' dominance over the Medes. While the three ribs allude to the empire's three major conquests, Lydia, Babylon, and Egypt. How's that for precision? A leopard with four wings and heads emerges as the third beast, symbolizing the swift, wide-reaching conquest of the Greek Empire under Alexander the Great. The remarkable precision continues with the four heads, each representing a segment of his realm that was divvied up after he died. The narrative shifts dramatically with the introduction of the fourth beast. Unlike its predecessors, this terrifying creature with its iron teeth and ten horns defies comparison to any known creature. Whether you subscribe to the Roman Empire or the Islamic Empire interpretation, its might and prolonged dominance over vast territories align with the characteristics of this beast. The ten horns suggest a series of rulers, while an eleventh, boasting of great things and persecuting the faithful, prophesies the Antichrist yet to come. Then the Ancient of Days shows up and puts an end to the beast. To leave no doubt as to God's revelations about the future to Daniel, we see yet another expansion of the prophesied empires in Daniel's vision of the ram and the goat. Detailed in chapter 8, this vision unfurls a narrative steeped in symbolic imagery and granular divine foretelling. The vision places Daniel in Susa, the capital of Elam, where he sees a ram with two high horns, one higher than the other, standing beside the canal. The ram, charging west, north, and south, becomes unstoppable symbolizing the Medo-Persian Empire's expansive conquest under King Cyrus the Great and his successors. 
The two horns represent the Medes and the Persians, with the higher horn signifying the dominance of the Persians, just like we saw with the lopsided bear. Suddenly, a goat from the west, swift as the wind and with a prominent horn between its eyes, charges the ram with fierce power, breaking its horns and trampling it underfoot. This goat illustrates the Greek Empire, with the large horn symbolizing Alexander the Great, whose rapid conquest dismantled the Persian Empire. The goat's remarkable speed and the decisive defeat of the ram underscore the swiftness and totality of Alexander's victories. However, at the height of its power, the goat's large horn breaks, replaced by four notable ones pointing toward the four winds of heaven. As we saw in the previous prophecy with the four-headed beast, this transformation from one large horn to four smaller ones signifies the division of Alexander's empire among his four generals following his untimely death, a division that led to the creation of separate Hellenistic kingdoms. The vision takes a darker turn with the emergence of a small horn from one of the four, which grows in power, reaching toward the south, the east, and the beautiful land of Israel. This horn, symbolizing a king who will rise from one of the four successor kingdoms, is one of many prophecies with layered fulfillment, both historical and future. The historical fulfillment, which was of course future to Daniel, occurred with Antiochus Epiphanes, who horrifically persecuted the Jews. The angel Gabriel explains that the vision also concerns end-time events under Antichrist that will mirror and dwarf the trials and tribulations experienced under Antiochus. The accuracy with which this prophecy was fulfilled is nothing short of amazing. With Alexander's swift conquest, the division of his empire, and the tyranny of Antiochus all occurred as foretold by Daniel. This prophecy not only validates the divine inspiration of the Bible, but also serves as a reminder of God's sovereign control over history, the present, and the future. Few events capture the imagination quite like this incident that took place on the night of October 12, 539 B.C., during the reign of Belshazzar, one of Nebuchadnezzar's successors. In fact, this event is the origin of the idiom, the writing is on the wall, that is still used today. In chapter 5, King Belshazzar is throwing a big party for a thousand of his nobles. As the wine flows and the king gets tanked up, he orders the sacred vessels that had been seized from Solomon's temple decades earlier to be brought out. Then he starts using them to toast pagan gods with his nobles, wives, and concubines. In the midst of this blasphemy, a disembodied hand appears, writing a message on the palace wall that nobody can read. The king is so freaked out that his knees are literally knocking and he can barely stand. Desperate to know what the writing says, he summons all his soothsayers and promises to make anyone who can decipher the message the number three man in all the kingdom. Unfortunately, none of them can read it, much less interpret it. The queen steps up and says she knows of a man named Daniel who can help. Daniel is brought to the palace. He takes a look at the writing and explains that it says, Mene, Mene, Tekel, Upharsin. He then explains that Mene means God has numbered the days of your reign and brought it to an end. Tekel means you have been weighed on the scales and found wanting. And Perez, the singular of Eupharsin, means your kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. The fulfillment of this prophecy is both swift and dramatic. That very night, Belshazzar is killed and Darius the Mede takes the kingdom. The accuracy with which this prophecy was fulfilled down to the very night of its pronouncement highlights the meticulous detail and sovereign control God exercises over historical events. 
It reassures us of God's omnipotence and the reliability of His Word, while serving as a cautionary tale about the consequences of irreverence and arrogance. Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks, found in Daniel 9, 24 through 27, not only offers a timeline for significant events in Jewish history, but also intricately weaves the coming of the Messiah into the fabric of time itself. Today we delve into this prophecy, its interpretation, the remarkable fulfillment of the first 69 weeks, and the anticipation of the final 70th week. The prophecy begins with the angel Gabriel explaining to Daniel that 70 weeks have been decreed for his people in the holy city to finish transgression, put an end to sin, atone for wickedness, bring in everlasting righteousness, seal up vision and prophecy, and anoint the most holy place. Weeks here is understood to represent weeks of years, meaning each week equals seven years, totaling 490 years. This prophecy divides the 490 years into three parts, seven weeks, 49 years, 62 weeks, which is 434 years, and a final week, seven years. The first seven weeks likely pertain to the period it took to rebuild Jerusalem, with the following 62 weeks extending to the anointed one, the ruler, who is recognized as Jesus Christ. These date calculations are pretty complex, since it involves our Gregorian calendar, the Jewish calendar based on lunar cycles, some leap years, and the transition from B.C. to A.D. I won't show every step of that here, but can provide those calculations if anyone is interested. For our purposes here, we can deduct from Ezra 7, 12 through 26, and other historical records, that the decree from Artaxerxes to rebuild Jerusalem occurred in July or August in 457 B.C. We know from Daniel 9.25 and 9.26 that 69 weeks of seven-year periods, 483 years, after the decree to rebuild Jerusalem was issued, Messiah would be cut off. Ready for some goosebumps? 483 biblical years from the July to August 457 B.C. time frame puts us in the spring of 27 A.D. Since best estimates put Jesus' birth around 5 B.C., he would have been about 33 years old in the spring of 27 A.D. If we then look at a calendar of Jewish holidays for 27 A.D., we find that Passover began on Thursday, April 10th. We know the Last Supper was the Seder dinner to begin Passover. Then came the day of unleavened bread, when the Passover must be killed. And he sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat. Luke 22, 7 and 8. We can therefore conclude that Jesus was crucified on Friday, April 11th, 27 A.D. If we go exactly 483 Jewish years backward from that date, we arrive at August 6, 457 B.C., as the day that Artaxerxes issued the decree to rebuild Jerusalem. Given God's eye for detail, I believe that decree was indeed issued on August 6, 457 B.C., and that Daniel's prediction of Christ's crucifixion was accurate not only to the year, but to the day. Interestingly, there's a pause in the prophetic timeline after the 69th week, after the crucifixion, a period not explicitly accounted for within the prophecy. This hiatus is where we currently are, often referred to as the church age or the age of grace, the time between Christ's crucifixion and second coming. The final 70th week of Daniel's prophecy is a future period of seven years, the tribulation described in the book of Revelation. This will commence with a seven-year covenant or treaty made or confirmed by the Antichrist. 
Midway through this period, this evil ruler will break the covenant, launching the Great Tribulation. The culmination of the 70th week, the end of the Tribulation, is marked by significant events. The return of Christ, the defeat of the Antichrist, the establishment of God's kingdom on earth, and the fulfillment of the promise to bring everlasting righteousness and seal up vision and prophecy. I can't wait. This prophecy from chapter 11 is the final one we'll cover on the prophecies of empires that have already been fulfilled. If you thought the earlier ones were impressive, and they were, prepare to have your mind blown by this one. This one is so specific that it predicts events like political marriages and assassinations with scientific level precision, often including names of people who hadn't even been born. We'll do a high-level summary of this one because to cover this prophecy in detail would require an episode lasting hours. The prophecy begins by talking about a powerful king who would arise in Greece, whom we know from earlier prophecies to be Alexander the Great. We've also already learned that after Alexander's death, his kingdom would be divided among four of his generals. This prophecy zooms in on two of those generals, the king of the north, and the king of the south. And it is so granular, so specific, it's almost like Daniel had a time machine that let him zap into the future and observe the tiniest machinations of empire intrigue. In a way, he did. It just happened to be an angel, probably Gabriel, who explained the vision to Daniel, as opposed to some contraption. It took the angel a while to get to Daniel on this occasion, since he had a three-week battle with a demon who blocked his way, and he ended up getting help from the archangel Michael to win the fight and continue on his way to Daniel. When he got there, he explained that the king of the north represents the Seleucid Empire, based in Syria, while the king of the south represents the Ptolemaic Empire, based in Egypt. The prophecy goes into great detail about the conflicts and political maneuverings between these two empires over several centuries. As for granularity of detail, verse 6 talks about a daughter of the king of the south marrying the king of the north, which did happen historically. Verse 7 then mentions that she would lose her position and return to her father's land which also came true and included divorce and assassination. Verse 9 speaks of a general from the king of the north attacking the king of the south, which occurred during the reign of Antiochus III. And verses 10 through 11 mention a counterattack by the king of the south, followed by a retaliatory strike by the king of the north, all of which took place during this time period. Verse 13 says that the king of the north would come against a fortress of the king of the south, but he would turn back and not prevail. This exact scenario played out in history when Antiochus III attacked Alexandria, the capital city of the king of the south, but had to withdraw after suffering heavy losses. Chapter 11 is so detailed that it literally reads like a history book. Attacks, counterattacks, political marriages, backstabbing, military strategy, and more. It predicted personalities like Antiochus and Cleopatra. But while it's history now, it wasn't them. It was prophecy. It was written by God through Daniel hundreds of years before these things happened. I know you guys get tired of hearing this plea on so many videos, because I do too. But if you find these episodes helpful, please take a moment to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell. It takes so little time and makes so much difference. Thanks for considering. Finally, Daniel's prophecies, particularly in chapters 7, 8, and 9, introduce us to a figure of unprecedented deceit and malevolence. This future ruler, known as Antichrist, the Beast, the Man of Lawlessness, and the son of perdition, 
will emerge from the remnants of a former empire. I believe he will emerge from the Islamic world, and I'll elaborate on that as soon in its own episode. Whether you believe as I do or hold to the Roman interpretation, this monster is on the way. His early rise will be by deception and intrigue as he creates a short and false peace. He will charm and bamboozle the world. There are many reasons that point to us being near to this time, but one of the strongest indicators for me is that I know the world is ready to accept this monster. A significant percentage of the masses are godless, and where God isn't, Satan will be. We see it every day. People whose minds and souls are infected with satanic evil. They cheer every perversion, every hideous and harmful behavior imaginable. They call good evil and evil good. They're filled with seething rage. They recoil at the name of Jesus. And they're convinced that they're the virtuous ones, even as their ideology destroys the society around us day by day. These people, most certainly including the world's mainstream media, are going to slobber and fawn over the Antichrist. As they do, their rage at everything good and decent, everything godly, will increase exponentially. Even worse, there are those who profess Christianity who are and will be among those who see that Bible-based faith and lifestyles. They've bought into the doctrines that tickle their itching ears, that tell them what they want to hear instead of what the Bible says. The world is ready for the beast. I know many of my brothers and sisters watching this fervently believe in a preacher of rapture. I'll do an episode soon explaining in detail why I left the pre-trip camp, but for now I would ask you to simply consider the possibility that you could be wrong. Think of it as a just-in-case exercise. To think about it, pray about what you would feel and do if the Antichrist appeared, if the tribulation kicked off, and if we believers are still here. Would your faith be shaken? Would you question everything you've believed for so long? Just think about it. Pray about it. As we wind down this episode, I urge you to study the amazing book of Daniel. It demonstrates the sovereignty of God who knows the end from the beginning. It proves the Bible is real, and it reminds us that God is intimately involved in human affairs, guiding the course of history according to His plan. Perhaps most of all, as we look at the accuracy with which these prophecies predicted things that happened in our past, we can know with confidence that the prophecies about our future are just as reliable. Those of us who follow Christ can indeed rest assured that our King is coming back to crush wickedness and set up a world government based on truth and righteousness. I take great comfort in knowing that God is still on the throne today, guiding the rise and fall of kings and kingdoms, presidents and prime ministers, and leaders of every kind, despite the evil madness that seems to be in control everywhere we turn. Without that knowledge, this world would depress me to no end. But I know the evil, despicable, repugnantly dishonest officials who surround us are no more than God's pawns. As hard as it may be, we're commanded to pray for these corruptocrats and tyrants. Pray that they will bend to God's will. Pray that they will see the light. Most won't ever see the light, but we're commanded to pray just the same. Then let Almighty God sort them out. God is in control and working everything out for our good and His glory. Thanks for joining me today, and I hope you learned something new about the fascinating book of Daniel. Maranatha.